Hello everyone, welcome to this research methods tutorial about experiments. Just to recap, the slides with the pause button need to be in your notes as a minimum. You should also try to add into your notes some examples or questions that you might have about the material so that we can discuss these in class. And you could also, if you wanted to, start to read around the subject by following the web links or by having a look in your textbook. This tutorial will cover the types of experiments, such as lab, field and quasi-experiments, and also different ways that we can design experiments, which include independent groups, repeated measures and matched pairs. It's really important that you don't confuse a type of experiment with an experimental design, and we'll talk about what each of these means as we go through. So lab experiments, as the name suggests, are carried out in controlled lab environments. For psychology purposes, a lab could just be a room with an overhead projector in it or any pieces of equipment that the researcher might need. Here, the independent variable is deliberately manipulated by the researcher. One of the strengths of a lab experiment is that extraneous variables can be minimised. Because it's carried out in a lab, the researcher has control over the environment and the time of day, the conditions in which the experiment takes place. So we can make sure that we've minimised as many of those extraneous variables as we can. Another strength is that because we've minimised those extraneous variables, it allows us to make more causal conclusions by saying that the independent variable is the thing that's affecting the dependent variable we can be more sure that the IV is causing the change in the DV and that nothing else is getting in the way of that result. Lab experiments do have their weaknesses as well. Um, one of the bigger weaknesses is that the experimental tasks can be said to lack mundane realism, which just means that they're unrealistic. The tasks that participants are asked to perform in lab experiments tend to be very artificial and bear no resemblance to what they might do in real life. Another weakness is that participants might show demand characteristics, which means that they'll behave in a way they think the experimenter wants them to behave. They know they're in an experimental situation, so they know that the experimenter is looking for them to do something specific. They might try to figure out what the aim of the experiment is and then either go along with the researcher or go against what they're looking to find. Field experiments are carried out in natural environments, so the participants might not know that they're taking part in an experiment. The independent variable is still being deliberately manipulated, however. These are the kind of studies that might take place on school playgrounds or in shopping centres. Participants are just going about their normal lives. One of the strengths of a field experiment is that there are fewer demand characteristics. Because the participants are unaware often that they're taking part in an experiment, they won't change their behaviour. So the behaviour of the participants is much more natural. There's also much greater ecological validity, which means that because the study takes place in real life, the results can be generalised to real life. Think of these as the opposite of a lab experiment. Looking at the weaknesses, we have far less control over the extraneous variables which might affect the results. So again, it's the opposite really to a lab experiment. These studies can sometimes be difficult to replicate as the conditions where the experiment is carried out won't always be the same. So it will be difficult to carry out the experiment again in exactly the same conditions. And the last type of experiment that you need to know about is a quasi-experiment, or sometimes called a natural experiment. This is where the independent variable is naturally occurring, so it's not manipulated by the researcher. This is things like different ages, different races, genders. We can't actually manipulate those things as researchers, so they're natural experiments. These have very high ecological validity because the independent variable is naturally occurring anyway. However, in terms of weaknesses, because we've got no control over the independent variable or any other extraneous variables, it's much harder to identify cause and effect. It's also next to impossible to replicate because these naturally occurring variables cannot be deliberately manipulated. OK, let's have a look at experimental design. It might help you to think about experimental design as being different types of car. They're all cars, but they're all constructed and designed very, very differently. 
they all have different strengths and different weaknesses. In the same way, there are different techniques and different methods we can use to put our experiments together, and each of those has strengths and weaknesses that go with it. In an independent group's design, participants only take part in one of the experimental conditions. So for example, we might have group one who would take part in condition A, which might be trying to remember a list of 10 words. We could then have group two, who are completely different participants, taking part in condition B, which might be looking at 10 pictures to remember. Each of these participants only does one of those conditions. Because there are different participants in each condition, think about how this might present the researcher with extraneous variables. What differences might there be between the participants in condition A and the participants in condition B? And why might this be a problem? Also, though, think about the fact that each participant only takes part in one of those conditions. So they won't have become bored or tired or even more practiced by the time they get on to doing the second, third or even fourth condition in some experiments. Why might this be a good thing? Okay, in a repeated measures design, all of the participants take part in all of the experimental conditions. So here we'd have one group of participants take part in condition A, and then the very same group of participants would take part in condition B. Again, think about the questions from the last slide about boredom or practice effects. How might these affect the results if by the time the participants get to condition B or condition C, if they've had a lot of practice at whatever task they're doing or if they're just bored or tired and have had enough, what effect might this have on the results of the later conditions? Because all the participants are the same, we're comparing like for like. So we've minimised those participant variables um, because we're using a repeated measure design. So we've taken out some of those extraneous variables. One way to overcome the problem of boredom or practice effects is called repeated measures counterbalancing. So counterbalancing is really just there to reduce those order effects. So here we'd have participants in condition A, and then the same participants would go on and do condition B. A different group of participants would start with condition B, and then they would go on to do condition A. So we've reversed the order. And what this means is that we don't work through the conditions in exactly the same order. So by the time they get to condition B or C, they might have been bored, and this could affect the results. So if some participants start with condition B, we've ruled out that effect. And the last type of experimental design that you need to know about is called a matched pairs design. And this aims to reduce the participant variables between the different experimental conditions by matching the participants as closely as possible on some key variables to try and make each group as similar as possible. So we could have a participant, Sally, who's six years old, she's left-handed and she's got an IQ of 90. And we would try and match her with another similar participant. So here we've got Rosie, who's also six years, also left-handed, and has a very similar IQ score. They're unlikely to match completely. So we've matched our two participants, and then what we do is randomly assign them to an experimental condition. So Sally would be in condition A, and Rosie would be in condition B. And what we've tried to do is just to ensure that we're still trying to compare like for like, and we've minimised those, those extraneous variables to do with participants. And that's all for this tutorial. Thanks very much, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.